Hi everyone, it's me again. Uh, so you're watching Show Bouillon uh, live on Instagram. And uh, today for this new episode, uh, I'm gonna host uh, James Harper from uh, Filter Stories. And so <clears throat> um, James created a podcast about um, stories mostly happening in the origin and producing uh, countries a few years ago. And he's also responsible for the new podcast design of the um, SCA, which I, I really recommend you uh, to listen. And um, so today we're going to share a lot of stories happening in the origin. The show bouillon of today will happen in English. And um, next week we're going to host Sophie Nis from uh, Sukafina Specialty. And the week after, Ludovic Maillard from uh, SCA uh, France. But today, so it's going to happen with uh, James Harper. So I'm waiting now for James to connect. So we can start this uh, probably in a few uh, minutes and uh, I see that James is online probably looking on uh, how to connect and here is the request so I'm gonna accept there we go I'm trying to connect hey whoa I'm on <laughs> yes. exciting. exciting it's official <laughs> it's official here we are hello everybody thanks for tuning in <laughs> so this is your first live uh, on Instagram First live. I hate Instagram. Absolutely hate it. But here I am. So, you know, let's talk. <laughs> so I force you to, to join on Instagram. Uh, yeah. Cool. But uh, James, uh, thanks for being yeah. here today um, for this next uh, episode of Show Bouillon. So today it's going to be in English. And um, I'm very sorry to all your French, French <laughs> speaking speakers out there. No, no, it's fine, it's fine. Um, but so maybe can, you, maybe can you introduce yourself for the people who don't know who you are? Yeah. So my name is James Harper. Uh, I'm probably most well known for having a podcast called Filter Stories. Filter Stories is like a narrative documentary podcast that explore like what's really happening in the coffee world. Um, the, they're a bit like This American Life or, um, you know, like Radio Lab. You saw this kind of like narrative radio. And yes. yeah, um, but basically I explore the, uh, the, the coffee supply chain and how it connects, how our coffee, uh, coffees are connected um, to these really big trends that happen across the world, such as, you know, uh, like how do we know whether the, the, the price we're paying for our coffees, the money we pay for our coffees, how does it end up to the farmer? Or maybe there are issues around, um, you know, is, our, is the, our choice of coffee fueling a civil war somewhere? Um, yes. You know, our coffee is... Being a consumer in the 21st century is a kind of, it's a pretty wild, a lot of power to have. And um, I, I kind of pull across those threads uh, through Filter Stories, uh, these, these radio documentaries. I've also worked as, uh, for The Barn as their uh, head, head of wholesale, which is a Berlin roaster. I've done, a, I've done sale, coffee sales in Australia for a big roaster. And before that, I was a banker. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Wow. So what a uh, journey. And uh, yes. also, so I highly recommend uh, anyone to listen to Future Stories if you haven't done yet. And also, you've you've um, you've helped created the new SCA podcast series about the World Championships. Oh, yeah. Has anyone listened to that by any chance? Yeah, <laughs> I, I've listened to you, it. You heard it? And, okay, uh, great. Yeah, of course. Uh, you even mentioned a Belgian woman living in Guatemala, I think, on the fourth episode that I have no idea who she is, but I'm going to investigate. Yeah, her. that's her. She's great. Yeah, yeah. She's awesome. No, no. And uh, I thank you for those uh, podcasts because it's really, I really like the, the format and it's really uh, interesting to learn more about the history of the championships. It's, I, I love it. Yeah, it's really, uh, really nice. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if anybody um, yeah, uh, doesn't know the coffee championships, um, they're pretty nerdy. Um, and, yes, I but confirm. They're pretty that. nerdy, <laughs> and it's really only coffee professionals who really give a give a give a. Can I swear on this? Can I swear? I'm gonna swear. Who really, who really care uh, about this? But there's some great stories in there, and I don't know. It kind of helps explain why there's this huge specialty coffee movement across the world, where people get so excited about these new cafes, and it's all kind of told through the story of the championships as well. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Wow. Okay. So maybe to start uh, with the first question, it's a bit um, the first question, the same for everyone, but what is the difference for you between commodity and specialty? What makes a difference uh, according to you? 
Oh my God, start easy, why don't you? <laughs> start easy. What even is specialty coffee these days? I mean, personally speaking, um, uh, what is specialty coffee? Well, well, commodity coffee is basically uh, uh, any coffee uh, that is, um, uh, okay, let me think about this for a second. Okay. Well, we all know that specialty coffee is coffee of a higher quality, you know, in a technical, in technical uh, perspective. Coffee that has a story, coffee that has a certification. Starbucks is technically specialty coffee in, in some definitions. Um, commod and, and so it has to have something that's, that's special about it. It has to kind of taste better than a, re than a regular coffee, but it also has to um, have some, an attribute to it. It has to be like, maybe is it, is it helping the environment? Is there a farmer story attached to it? Is there something which makes it more than just bog standard commodity coffee? You know? um, so to me, that would be the distinction. There's also a flavor distinction. I could go technical on that, but I think everyone knows about that. Um, uh, yeah, so that, I think that's, uh, that's a good place to start is that you have commodity coffee, you have regular box standard coffee, and then you have something that's something extra, that's special, that differentiates it. Yes. Um, and... mm, yeah, so that's that. that. Okay. Please go on. <laughs> no, no, fine. So if I understand it, you make a, a, a difference between the taste attributes in specialty and meaning that commodity is most of the time not good coffee taste-wise. Is it like uh, something like... Uh, how can I say this in English? Like all commodity coffee are kind of the same uh, on the taste profile and not really interesting or there might be sometimes differences mm. for some reason. Yeah, I mean, I, I look at it, um, it doesn't, taste is important, of course, because taste is, you know, it's you grade the coffee, right? So if it's like a, if it's a low grade coffee, it doesn't taste very good. But mm -hmm. more than anything else, you know, you can have coffee that is, um, that is different, differentiated coffee. That's not commodity coffee. That, um, uh, that doesn't taste great, but I would still call it not commodity coffee. And, and I think it really comes down to price. That's like the big difference. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so when you have, for example, um, specialty, so yeah, so you, you can have, a, so, <clears throat> Commodity coffee is anything, is anything that, doesn't, that, that is like the standard price for coffee, the global price of coffee, you know, that gets traded on, 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 global on big exchanges and everything. Um, you know, a, a coffee is a coffee is a coffee. There's no distinction there. And especially coffee, in my opinion, is anything that is different to that. that and because perhaps it has a certification, because perhaps it tastes better, um, maybe because there's a farmer attached to it, that there's a farmer story attached to it that we want to pay more for. Um, so, yeah, so it's basically... Anything that can justify paying a little bit extra for, for this thing. And um, based on your experience on the, um, so you traveled a lot uh, through the creation of your podcast and met a lot of producers with a lot of different stories. A lot of producers, um, yeah, a lot of stories. Mm. Can you tell us maybe, can you share us maybe a few experiences uh, when you meet producers? How does it work like to produce oh. uh, coffee? <laughs> yeah, I, I yeah here we go. Okay, many. here we go. Here but let stories. me get okay. more specific. Uh, like when a producer uh, make, uh, make coffee, what are the options for them to sell the coffee? Like do they sell mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. people buying in the country or do yeah. they are connected to a roastery in Europe or America and it's very yeah. easy? And is there a difference in quality? Do they have both commodity yeah. and specialty? And what are the networks to get rid of the coffee and sell it? Tell you what, tell you what, why don't I just play big and small in El Salvador right now? You can all sit back and listen to that episode of the podcast. But no, um, uh, so basically this is, the question is a leading question. So um, I, made a, I made a series where I spent a month in El Salvador and, amongst, and, I, and I created a, um, a comparison episode about uh, a, a coffee farmer that came from a lot of wealth and I contrasted what it was like for them having a specialty coffee business, sorry, having a coffee growing business compared to yes. somebody who um, came from a lot less wealth. Well, not the poorest of the poor, but you know, very, very humble, very modest. And mm -hmm. what, what are the differences in terms of their experiences? And um, I, so for example, um, the big producer, let's talk about the big guys, you know, the big boys, right? So uh, the, this, this, this man, uh, I called him Armando in the series. Um, Armando, he has, um, he owns every Taco Bell from El Salvador down to Panama. You know, we think okay. about coffee producers as, as, these, as people who are, um, you, you know, who, who, I don't know, who, who work in the field. This guy's a business guy. 
you know, he, he was educated in America. He came from quite a wealthy family as well of producers. Uh, uh, and there's a whole backstory to that about the history of El Salvador and, and, um, and politics and civil war and social inequalities, which I can go into as well. But that's parked up for the moment. This guy comes from wealth. And what does that mean? That means he, he, when he was in the 90s, you know, when he was in his 30s, um, he basically was running some of the biggest coffee mills in Central America. So all these little farmers everywhere would kind of send him coffee and he'd process this coffee and then he'd sell it to exporters or, you know, in bulk. Um, so he was kind of already up the supply chain. He was in the processing of the coffee. Yes, um, okay. When he <clears throat> wanted, he also had his own farms. And what happened is that uh, his farms, uh, his family owned a lot of farms, a lot of historical farms because, you know, they were big coffee, coffee growing family. Um, very wealthy. And in the 1980s, the government came along and took the majority of his coffee farms away. In fact, he had just one left. Uh, and that's part of the politics of the, of the day. So he had this one coffee farm and he had a lot, a lot of mills. And he decides, in the, and, he, and, he, and he realizes that in the, late two, in the late 90s, in the late 90s, he sees that coffee is, um, the, the coffee price has collapsed again. You have, um, coffee being sold for less than a dollar a pound. It's, it's like, you can't make money on this. You have to get, you have to differentiate your coffee somehow to something to just earn more than this terrible low market price that, that is affecting him. So what he decides to do is he decides to go into specialty coffee. He sees there's this trend. He sees over there in Europe, look, you have this guy called Tim Wunderbo. He's like set up this cafe in Oslo that's making this you know, beautiful coffee. Um, you, have, you have these barista competitions. Like there's, there's, there's something, there's a, people that care about quality. And he sees this and he's like, ah, so what I'm going to do is start investing in quality. And so um, he invests a lot of money into his farm. He begins to really, you know, uh, you've got to imagine like here, he had this massive farm producing just lots of generic coffee. Coffee is coffee is coffee is coffee. Now he's like, whoa, okay. So the coffee here from this varietal, from this part of the farm is, I mean, this tastes better than this. So he starts segmenting his farm, splitting it out. Um, uh, he starts investing a lot into the farm um, in terms of uh, picking it very, you know, picking the right, the ripest cherries, you know, putting in fertilizer that you can only find in Northern Europe, Northern European fertilizer in El Salvador. He can okay. afford it. <laughs> this well, stuff. That's a lot of, that's very specific as a story, you know, uh, yeah. not every farmer can uh, afford that. No maybe, I guess. This stuff is rocket fuel for coffee plants, absolute rocket fuel. And, um, and so basically he gets to a situation where, okay, now he's growing all this coffee, but now he's got to find a market for it. So where mm -hmm. do you go to find a market for this higher quality coffee you're, you're, you're growing? And what he does is he enters something that was just starting up in the early 2000s, which was the El Salvador's first cup of excellence competition. Okay, makes sense. Uh, yeah. Makes sense. yeah. And so, so what he does, he, he enters his coffee in and he does really, really well. In fact, every single year he enters this competition, which is like, what it does, it takes all the best green coffees from El Salvador and you put them on a the table and you taste them and you say, which one's the best? Yes. And um, he never wins, but he does really, really well. Uh, you, you know, he, he, he's, always, he's oftentimes in the top 10. Through this competition, right? So, he, so he, he finds buyers and the buyers are ready to pay him lots of really kind of high prices for this really, really tasty coffee he's growing on his farms. And so, he basically found buyers. He, he, he found buyers who were prepared to pay more. And um, he, when, I, when I met him last year, he was like, James, I'm sold out. Okay. Every, I haven't even harvested my coffee yet, but every single bean that I'm going to yeah, pick is going to be wait, sold. Wait, because he doesn't, no one produce 100% specialty coffee. No, but he claimed he did. He's, he's a great salesman. He's a great salesman. Okay. And he's so popular that people were the so coffee buyers, coffee roasteries in Europe, you know, they went over there and was like, oh, we just want your coffee. We'll pay anything. So he was sold out. I mean, it's, it's a fantastic business model. Absolute genius. Um, and yeah. And so basically he used wealth to, you know, to invest deep into, deep into his um, coffee farms. Uh, he had the best agronomists on tap who he could call on and they came in and they helped him out. Um, that he, he had the money to enter his, comp his coffee into these really big competitions. Um, and he found his buyers and he made these relationships and networks and boom, you know, he got himself into a very 
lucky position where he could grow coffee and sell it and not have to worry about the price or finding a buyer. And he was always going to cover his costs and make a lot of money at the same time. That is the best case scenario. Yeah, it seems like really <laughs> the best, the best case, case scenario. Case I was about scenario. to say, this is very <laughs> uncommon, I would say. Right. What is the other scenario? Oh, okay. So the other scenario is, unfortunately, the vast majority of scenarios when it comes yeah. to coffee growing in El Salvador, mm -hmm. uh, or just generally across the world. So, uh, okay. So the, the, the scenario that the other, so in this episode, I profiled this guy who had, had, had did a really, uh, had a, did a very, um, a lot of money to kind of start his business. And then I also profiled um, a woman who inherited a farm. She was like a small little grower up on a mountain somewhere, um, to a little parcel of land, like a couple of hectares, like not very big, had one employee, one full-time employee. Um, and she was a school teacher. She wasn't even a coffee farmer. Her, her, most of her life was spent being a school teacher. And um, uh, so she's, so she, the thing is right, um, her farm was, she was very, she's actually quite lucky as coffee farmers go in El Salvador because her farm was in this amazing location. Had just the right sun. She had just the right varietals. Her pacamara, which is a, quite a, a varietal of coffee known for their big beans, uh, very kind of juicy notes. I mean, it was, hers is an exceptional pacamara. And it, she's kind of got lucky. She was on the right side of the mountain, you know, <laughs> with the right wow. bean, with the right yeah. variety. And, um, and so, it's interesting, her motivations are very different, right? She doesn't want to like to conquer the world with her coffee. What she wanted to do was to provide local employment to her community. She wanted to keep this coffee farm afloat because it had, um, she had a shade avocado trees. And so when I was there, we were walking underneath these, av these avocado trees, loads of them. And when, they're, when they, you harvest them, she gets 10,000 avocados. Wow. And she wanted to give these avocados free to the local community. Um, that was her motivation to sustain the community with employment yeah. of avocados. That was her thing. Um, and, she, uh, but she, her problem was that, okay, I've, I've inherited this farm. It's small. Um, I just, but uh, you know, these coffee prices, the prices that I'm selling at the commodity price are so low. I can't cover the costs of my production. What do I do? And, uh, she was desperate. I mean, she was trying very, very hard using all the connections she could. So she entered her coffee into the same competition that the big guy did. Yeah. So that, and um, her coffee did very well. She, got, she came in, I think, she was one of the top 30 coffees on the table that year. And it was an exceptional coffee. And in fact, I think maybe you even tried it. I did a Kickstarter afterwards, maybe. Um, uh, oh, but I, I, yeah, okay, I have a bad memory, but I co contribute to one Kickstarter and I, I'm wondering if it's at this one. But uh, anyway, it must have been the other one then. All right, I did two of them, whatever. Because I received, um, a, sample, I received, a, sa I received a sample of, of beans, okay. but I don't think it's whatever. her. But anyway, okay. okay. Whatever. So, um, beautiful tasting coffee. Right. So she's like, okay, what I need, I need higher prices. I need higher prices to feed this community of avocados to keep Santos, my one worker, in, in employment, you know. Um, otherwise gangs come along, you know, it, it, pe people fall delinquency and all these sorts of issues. Um, but where can you, but you know, here she is, how, where can she go to get higher prices for her coffee? Mm -hmm. And um, the first thing she did was she, she went to all the mills. So there are all the little mills all around her. Some do okay, only accept organic. Some are kind of like cooperative mills, blah, blah, blah. And they just wouldn't give her very high prices. They're like, this is the great coffee, but we're not going to pay you very much for it. And she got really annoyed. Um, she entered it into the cup of excellence and was lucky enough to make it in, to get into the top 30. And through that, actually, she found a buyer in Russia. Okay. And this, by the way, is a success story because she was lucky in the first place to have the right varietal on the right side of the mountain. Yeah, you yeah, know. yeah. <laughs> you know, I met a lot of farmers in El Salvador who were much lower down, afflicted with all the coffee diseases. You know, they were basically, you know... Uh, they, they, they really struggled to send the kids to school. I mean, whatever money they made, I mean, they had to grow their own food to eat because there's no other way they could ever survive. You know, we're talking, you know, $10 a day type, you know, yeah. living. Yeah. And so she found this buyer in Russia, thankfully, and hopefully that is a relationship that continues. But outside of that, what could she have done? Now, I thought, hey, just do what the Armando did. Just do what the big guy did. You know, what the big guy did is... Um, well, for one thing, he went to all the big trade shows, you know, in America. 
he, you know, he sold himself. I'm selling this amazing coffee. Make those connections with roasters. Find the roasters. And she's like, fine. But for one, you know, I need a passport. I need a, more than, I need, yeah, I need yeah. a visa to get, to go, to leave anywhere. Out of wow. I need a visa. I earn, I earn $15 a day on my teacher's pension. You know, how am I going to afford a visa to meet a coffee buyer in New York? Also, I don't speak English. I speak Spanish. Like, what? Wait, wait, I'm going to go to New York and just like wander around, you know, speaking yeah, my yeah, Spanish. Yeah. I'm going to find... Oh my God. And then it's like, um, and then she's like, but also like, who, where are these competitions? You know, who, who, where are these trade shows? I mean, I need to be invited, right? I can't just turn up. Um, because, you know, she, well, her entire life, uh, you know, she, she, she's a teacher. What she, what she does great is, is teaching and, and, and helping students. And um, I'm going to argue a bit controversially, these are not these are not business skills necessarily. <laughs> They're not obviously business skills yeah. or entrepreneurial skills necessarily even. So um, you know, she, her entire life she was in her sixties, late fifties, sixties. You know, this wasn't her background. So where can you go? Where, what can she do? Um, that, so these are the sorts of challenges. And then right. So that's so this, this is it. And then you have the issue of maintaining the farm because because you can't if you don't get the high prices. How do you maintain the quality in the farm? How do you afford the fertilizer? Yeah. How do you afford the people to prune the coffee in just the right? How do you afford the pickers to be really mm. careful and slow? You've got to have prices that pay for all that. And where do you find them? So, they're, they're, so this, these were her issues. So she was in, this, in, a, in, a, in a kind of downward cycle where coffee prices are so low that uh, she can't, she's struggling to invest in the farm. And because uh, uh, she's not making very much money, she can't invest in the farm. But she's also comes from a social economic background that doesn't permit her to find buyers easily. Um, she doesn't come, she can't afford the visas. She doesn't know where to go. She doesn't have the cultural understanding um, and no fault of her own. It's just, she was born that way. You know, this is, this is, this is her lot. These are her cards in life. So, <laughs> There's a, there's a contrast, yeah. <laughs> Armando and Maria, you know. World but so w what is, uh, so when you're a small grower, farmer, like, is it really, I guess it's important to try to integrate like a cooperative to have more, uh, how do you say, more power in how you can get uh, a better understanding of what you produce and maybe uh, a better balance in how you can negotiate price or, mm. Um, mm -hmm. Because when she goes to to the different mills trying to sell coffee and nobody would give the right price, is it because those people do only commodity coffee and volume, or they're just not interested to to have solidarity in the business? So, what, what's your interpretation so, of okay, that? Okay, so so the, a big issue, so a big challenge with these mills, right? And there are loads of mills, by the way. Loads of people process coffee cherries or, or, or you know, and, and turn them into, into, into parchment, which is like one step along the way to turn them into a green bean, which then gets roasted and then we drink. Um, but so in that, in that kind of intermediate stage, yeah, you have all these, you, you, these mills, you know, they, they work with exporters. A lot, I can't generalize for everybody, but typically, you know, they, they uh, have relationships with all the farmers in the region. Sometimes, Farmers felt all the coffee, sometimes just a little bit of the coffee. It, it's kind of like, it's kind of like, I'm trying to think of what, what that relationship is. Sometimes that relationship is like, you know, you're, you're, you're looking for a taxi and it's like, you have all these different taxis you can choose, you know, which taxi you're going to hop into the, today. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, who's offering the lowest price? Um, that's probably a bad analogy, but that, that's kind of the idea. Who's offering the best yeah. price? You kind of shop around, right? Shop around. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, they buy the coffee and then they have to make their margins, you know, these inter intermediaries, these mills. So what do they do? They, they look around and they, um, uh, they find buyers, they find exporters, people who buy their coffee, their partially processed coffee, and then put that coffee onto container ships to sell, you know, to send them to, say, for example, Belgium or Germany, or whatever. Um, so these intermediaries, um, this is for the most part, for the most part, it, 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 the bulk of it is commodity coffee. So you're, it, this is like, this is like the, the, the global price for coffee, which is always, which has been low for such a long time. Um, and uh, it, the, the problem with a lot of these mills is that they're not really differentiated. They're not offering differentiated coffee a lot of the time. And some of them do, by the way, some of them do. Um, mm -hmm. In Maria's case, um, the local mill didn't. Now, 
could she find a mill that you know could pay a higher price yeah sure but i mean how far are you going to go with your coffee yeah, 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 in a yeah, truck yeah. Well, that's a cost as well yeah. you know, you know, trucks truck you know trucks cost money to ship and transport and if the mill is you know a day's drive away well that's well, that's all of a sudden the you know i don't think yeah, yeah, the, her little well. parcel of land is going to make the economics just don't make any sense mm. so there's something to do with scale as well you know the smaller you are the harder it is to make it as a small coffee producer and um okay i i wanted to to ask you like you were talking about the pay that makes a difference between commodity and specialty coffee but how if you pay a higher price can is there a mean to be sure that it will benefit the producer or it's not <laughs> <laughs> oh that's 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 the killer isn't it that's the killer um yeah, listen yeah there are but you have to be very specific as to you know who you are buying from so the thing is this is the kind of sad reality is that um we could buy specialty coffee and even in that circumstance we're paying you know we could be paying 15 euro for a sack of coffee for a bag of coffee and the producer has not got much better than the commodity price That is mm. an unfortunate reality. And that's to do with the nature. There are so many intermediaries. And so you can imagine, imagine Maria, right? A small little farmer in El Salvador. She takes her coffee. She goes down to the local mill and she sells her coffee and they buy it in bulk. Like, all right, we're going to buy all your coffee. Here's your price. All right, you're done. Go away. Relationship over. Then the mill starts tasting the coffee and they think, ooh, this, these beans are really good. These beans, not so good. What we're going to do, we're going to take these good beans, put them to one side, and we're going to sell those beans to the next intermediary at a higher price. And, that's, and we are going to take the profit for that because we did the work of identifying oh the high quality, quality coffee in the first place. And the rest we just sold, you know, in the commodity, whatever. Yes. And, and then those high quality beans, you know, they get passed through the chain up to the exporter, to the importer, to the roaster. And before you like, the roaster is charging us $15 a pound, you know, for a bag of coffee. And we think we're helping farmers you know, because it's a specialty coffee. Um, but because there's a lack of transparency, th that premium isn't getting passed down. Because how could it? I mean, what are you, what are you going to ask? You're going to ask, you know, the roaster? You can ask the roaster, hey, how much did the farmer get paid? <laughs> well, the roaster is going to ring the exporter. Uh, and, and the exporter, sorry, the importer. The importer is going to ring the exporter. You could do it. But I mean, there yeah, comes yeah. a point where you're, you're trading on so many commercial sensitivities and profit margins. And it's like, They're, they're just they're going to stonewall you. You know what? You're, you're too much hassle. You're asking too many questions. You're too much hassle. We have business to get on with. <laughs> But so, so, wait, so does it make a difference to have the name of a producer and the name of a cooperative on the coffee bag? Meaning that if you have the name of a producer, you know who is the producer. If you have the name of a cooperative, sometimes you don't know what happens to the producer right. of that cooperative right. or living right. around uh, the mill. Is it a better information somehow? Listen, it's better than nothing. It's better than nothing. But, but you know, the, the, so if you have a co-op, so, okay. If you see a cooperative, you have, you know, there, um, you should reach out and, and be like, you know, uh, unfortunately, the, the name is helpful, but the name is like, a, a, is a clue in, in terms of a, uh, um, an investigation that you have to basically do. As a coffee oh drinker, if you want to yeah. know if the, what the, whether the coffee farmer got paid a fair price, You've got to know the mill. That really helps in your investigation, but you have nowhere near close to the answer yet. You have yeah, to reach yeah. out to the mill and ask them, hey, who, who actually grew this coffee? <laughs> they might not even know because, you know, they, this, they take this farmer, they take that farmer, they take that farmer, it makes, make, you know, blend it all together and they sell it up the chain. Um, or you could find the farmer themselves. And great, that is really great. Um, but you're not done yet because you have to ask the farmer. Uh, if they're on the social media, easy. You know, you can Google them and you can find out and... Um, farmers love to know what coffee drinkers, from my experience, uh, coffee yeah, farmers yeah. love to know what, what coffee drinkers uh, think of their coffee. And um, if you ask them, you know, how do you feel about the remuneration you got for this coffee? Did it cover your production costs? You know, I see sorts of questions. Then I don't know. They, they might say, no, no, it didn't. And in that case, you're like, okay, right. So something's not working in this chain. Something's not working. But... Um... Is there, uh, okay, it, it's still very uh, su surprising to me because uh, when starting in the, in the industry, I thought, okay, when you have the name of the cooperative or the producer, you know the truth behind it. And the more I talk to people, the more I know already, but the more I, I really, it really emphasized how hard it is to, 
go deeper into and to go back to the producer. But do you think there are any efforts made by I don't know who to get there? Because I heard about the blockchain technology, some companies trying to work on that. But yeah, yeah. So for sure, there, there are so like, now look, there are solutions to this. Um, <clears throat> you can find a roaster that really puts a lot of emphasis on building connections with producers at origin. Uh, and more, but more specifically, you know, they do direct negotiations with prices with producers. In those circumstances, you're, you, can be, you can kind of rest assured that the price has to cover costs. You'd hope so. Um, so where those negotiations directly with producers are happening, that's a good sign. Not necessarily the solution, that's a good sign. Points in the right direction. Uh, another thing you can do um, is there's technology out there, uh, blockchain technology, as you mentioned. Um, I think is someone I have written about in the past. Mm -hmm. um, so what they do, I think, uh, is it's like a it's like a price verification technology. So imagine this, right? Uh, you know, when a farmer, you know, they have their, they have their truck full of coffee. When they dump that coffee into the mill, which then you know is the first step along this you know along the supply chain, um, mm -hmm. the price they get paid is noted, uh, but also uh, also, the, the coffee is tagged. So every time that coffee moves up the supply chain, you can look, you can look back and see, um, you know, who was the farmer and what did they get paid? And Adidas Coffee, you mentioned Farmer Connect, and that's interesting you bring that up. Um, because actually, Farmer Connect, I don't think, from my, when I last looked, they don't tell you what the farm gate price was. They tell you who the farmer is, great, but we need to know what they got paid. <laughs> Otherwise, what, what's the point? Because... All we're, all we're learning is that this is the farmer. This is, this is almost like, um, it's like using the uh, uh, blockchain to kind of hide the fact that we don't actually know what the farmer is still getting paid. We've got to know the farm gate price. Farmer Connect doesn't tell you the farm gate price, but it tells you that, oh, but we can feel good about ourselves because you know who the farmer is. No, only until we know the farm gate price. And we can't, um, and especially you have to be very, I think to be, I think you have to be very wary um, because a lot of intermediaries, they, they understand that um, we coffee drinkers want that traceability. We want to know who grew our coffee and that they got paid a fair price. And so, but oftentimes, you know, they can show us a transparency, but they don't, it doesn't always go, um, you know, okay, so, so it is, you're saying the farmer owns his or her data. Hey, let's, let's talk about this later. Let's talk about this later. I'll be curious to, to pick your brains on this. Um, but yeah. Uh, Farm gate price, that's what, I, that's, what, that's what I come down to. What is a farm gate price? But then it means that when the, when the producer gives the, the, the coffee to the meal, so who puts the data? It's like through an app and everybody puts the data together. Is there a form of yeah. control after yeah, the yeah. blockchain does the, the, the job? But it's kind of an agreement to use it all the way and uh, all together. And, uh... Yeah, totally. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah, as they say, you know, uh, crap data in, crap data out. So you got to make sure the data you're putting into that blockchain system is good data. Okay. And uh, yeah. But so this is very specific for now. It's not like a practice that is everywhere, all around. And uh, but, okay. But it's definitely reaching that, that idea of uh, getting more information yeah. to, that goes back to the farmer. I think, I think what's, what's interesting is that you, we couldn't... I mean, the, I think we've got to give ourselves some credit, right? Especially coffee from 20 years ago. Um, the whole notion of like, let's pay more for higher quality coffee. Like that was such, a, that was such an unknown notion back then. Um, and now that's just like standard. So, uh, and, that's a, and that's a great place. That's well. It's that's still only uh, less than 5% of the world market, but. Uh, it's okay, it's but, it's, but you know, yeah, it's a standard. It's, it's becoming more and more accepted, but this stuff is, the other thing you got to bear in mind is just how huge the coffee industry is. I mean, it's yeah. enormous. What, yeah. you know, what, tens of millions of farmers, you know, um, huge vast i mean huge chunks of they make up huge chunks of economies of many many countries i mean it's it's just a vast vast system and but, especially coffee that's a very it's a slither yeah but do you think that uh, commodity coffee is always uh, a bad story or you can still have if you work with the right people of course you can have lower quality but then having maybe labels that will give you a little more money or, or finding the right people or being part of a good cooperative that would redistribute the money and act really for the for the people i would say for the producer is it possible in commodity coffee because i hear very different stories all over the place and mm. yeah it seems that it's mm. not always black and white and very yeah, yeah. 
I mean, have you have you seen stuff you like that? Find, I haven't seen that. I haven't yeah. seen that. Um, <laughs> if you see that, if you've seen it, please tell me where that is. Okay. Um, <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> um, but for sure, the fact is, I mean, you know, I, I once had this idea, right? I had this a podcast idea. Maybe I'll even do it one day. I'm like, listen, we can, we can, so low coffee prices. This is a big issue. Not just because, you know, why is it a big issue? It's a big issue because um, coffee aside, it's bad for the economies of coffee producing countries. If people in countrysides, you know, in Central and, 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 and America and Colombia and whatever, if they can't make a living just growing coffee and selling it, then what does that mean? Um, oftentimes that leads to less employment in countryside. That means some more overcrowding in cities that ultimately that lands on the doorstep of, on the doorstep of the global north. You know, it lands on America's doorstep when you have, you know, ultimately caravans of people who don't have economic opportunities. So it matters um, beyond just, you know, um, the, the repercussions of this are huge. Now, what's really interesting is that if you, go, if you, if you rewind time to the 1950s, you know, the Soviet Union is like, you know, the big, the big boogeyman, you know, in, in the American story. And um, you have, um, America was very shrewd in that they kind of pioneered, uh, or they, they were very encouraging of a system whereby, you know, we will pay collectively a higher price for your coffees, you know, Central and South America. Um, and that will kind of, that, because we want you to be on our side. We want to put more of our money down to, you know, to economies which are poorer than ours. And, uh, and in many ways that worked. I mean, you, you didn't see the, the, you saw immigration, but you didn't see that wave of immigration that became, it dominates news headlines as like they do today. Back in the seventies, it was trickles as opposed to waves. And so why can't we go back to something like that? Why can't we go back to a time where we actually paid a higher price for our co for commodity coffee and we had an agreement where you could pay higher prices. Because it's, it's, as I said, it's good for people who grow coffee and it's good for us because you know, you don't have, you don't, you're not gonna have the politics of people trying to cross the border. Um, now, uh, so I had an idea, I, I had a dream once, like a, like a year ago, I had a dream for a podcast idea. I'm like, uh, why don't the big com coffee companies just, you know, decide to pay more for their coffee? Like, <laughs> just, just pay more, I mean, <laughs> just pay more, what, what does it take? You know, you can, you can call up, you can call the Dawag Brooks. You can, you can call up, um, you know, it, it's a very, cons coffee is a very consolidated in this industry where you have, um, you know, just a handful of companies, Nestle and, and a kind of German family that basically control the majority, like a huge chunk of the market. Yeah. Why don't, why don't we just get, to, get, get to the head of them and ask them, hey, just pay more for your coffees. And we have overnight, you know, fi just fix so many problems. Yeah. True. And, <laughs> and I, 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 could you imagine me sitting down with a microphone across from the CEO of Nestle being like, right, okay, start from tomorrow, you're going to pay more for your coffee. You're going to pay a dollar more per pound for coffee. That's it. Just do it. Done. You, you, have, you make so much money already that what's an extra dollar, seriously, per pound? But do you think, do you think the problem is that the coffee is the, in the exchange also, that maybe if it would go out of the exchange and have like a minimum price that doesn't fluctuate and uh, that, that would be also something to solve some issues in a way? Uh, because we always say that specialty is not related to the exchange where commodity is really fluctuating or not so much more like crushing uh, down all the time. But maybe the, also this is part of the problem. Why is this, why when we drink wine, grapes are not in the stock exchange where coffee is? Um... Well, that's, a, that's an interesting <laughs> question. Why isn't wine traded like <laughs> co coffee is? And I'm gonna argue, I mean, these, these, have, these have roots in, in, in our colonial past. This coffee, the coffee industry is built on the back of colonialism and yeah. uh, by the way, small plug uh, of a series coming out, History Coffee series, where in episode two, we talk about this very system. And in episode yeah. three, how that gets transformed into um, the global capitalist system, uh, you know, of, of, commod of commodity coffee. Um, anyway, that's by the by, coming out in January. But yeah, this, um, yeah, why, why, why do we, why does coffee have to be traded like this? Um, and uh, I, I, to me, that is the legacy of the past. It doesn't have to be. But the, yeah, fact that the fact that the fact is that it is, 
there are enormous systems that encompass tens of millions of people. How do you change, you know, all these systems to, um, to be like, you know, we're just going to, we're just going to find buyers directly now. Like, how's that going to work? We have too many, we have too many people. The system just chugs along as it is. It's, it's too, it's a beast. It's too big a thing to change. Yes, uh, I totally agree. Uh, I think we talk more and more about decolonizing the business model of coffee. Uh, I, I don't know where it's going to happen, but it's definitely now on the table and at least people talk about it. Um, yeah. But going back to commodity then, because it's kind of the, the problem, <laughs> mm. um, is that we talk a lot here, at least in, in Belgium, about a label in coffee and like, a, um, how do you say, not the label fair trade itself, but uh, it's equitable. It's, it's the way it's, yeah, Equitable. fair yeah. coffee. Fair Adding coffee. a little mon money on the stock exchange price and stuff like that. Mm. In this whole shit show, does it still make a little difference and a little help that is valuable for producer or it's really mm. diluted in, it doesn't really make a difference in, uh, for, as far as uh, what you witnessed or uh, the producer you met, uh, did some of them work with some labels because it was helpful, at least a minimum for them, even though it's not the best light? <sighs> you know, labels aren't a solution. They're not a silver bullet, but they're helpful and they're better than nothing. Um, <laughs> but the, the, the problem is there's no silver bullet, you know, especially the specialty yeah. coffee as a solution is too small. It's very hard to coordinate. It's very hard to scale. How do you scale relationships between roasters and producers? like that yeah. very very difficult to scale um the so i mean if you want to look at the history of certifications uh back in the um there's a there's a really great talk by, on the specialty coffee association uh rico where yanina grabs um talks about the when certifications came along they were offered as a solution to two kind of big problems one was the environmental degradation that coffee uh was causing you were talking, you know, you know, just as far as the eye can see, just, you know, fertilizer pumped coffee, you know, just cut down the rainforest, plant the coffee. Very bad for the environment. Um, and uh, yeah, and um, then a similar issue, uh, then another issue was the fact that co the coffee price was so low. So what was the solution? So what was the solution to that certifications? So the thing with certifications is like, okay, yeah, we can have a rainforest alliance to protect the environment. We can have uh, fair trade, you know, make sure it's a high price for a, a minimum price that people get paid in the worst case scenarios. That's, what, that's, what, that's how it works. Um, the thing is, um, the way it was sold to coffee producers was like, hey, listen, you coffee producers, you have to do it first. Okay. You produce the coffee, you get certified, and then we give, sell it to us to the West and we will pick up the slack. We will find, we'll build the market for these differentiated coffees. The pro but what you have today is that, uh, now I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna butcher this figure, but it was like um, of only 20% of all certified coffee is sold as certified coffee. Okay. <laughs> right? Wait, but what does it mean? I'm confused. It means that producers pay for a certification mm -hmm. and then the coffee is not sold with the certification? It's, yeah, it's like, there's just not enough market, you know, you're, you're not buying. Yeah. What it's saying is that, um, you know, you have for, let's say there's a hundred kilos of coffee that's coffee farm producers. And let's say it's all certified, um, um, uh, fair trade, only 20 kilos of those hundred kilos will be sold at fair trade prices. Oh, okay. So it's like, you have to, in advance say, okay, I'm going to have that amount or it's just a percentage or this, I is, guess this is globally, like this is globally, yeah. but it, okay. it, it, it gets to the idea that, wow. yeah, not all coffee grown under certifications is sold. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's the same for organic coffee right. in Ethiopia. It's almost all organic, but it's not all certified because it's more expensive or uh, stuff like that. Slightly different to the Ethiopian example. I would argue it's more to do with, um, if you are a coffee producer and you know you have paid all this money you know to be certified and then when you really need it like fair trade that's how it works right when the price collapses below a certain level fair trade steps in and says hey we're going to pay you this floor price for your coffee it's not a great price no one's saying it's a great price but it's better than the market is offering right now mm -hmm. and all you have to do to have this insurance 
is to um, be certified with us. The thing is, um, on average, if you, if you add up all the farms that grow um, fair trade coffee, you know, only 20% of that coffee is sold at that fair trade, fair trade price, which means even though you're certified at fair trade, you know, um, 80% of those coffees will be sold at lower price, the, the market price. Yeah, yeah, but it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> which, which, which to me is like, uh, um, and, and, you know, it's, to me, to me this, this, this is a sign that, you know, we are not trying hard enough to, to sell, you know, certifications in the West. We've kind of let producers, producers down. They've taken this huge risk, you know, to uh, grow this coffee uh, and certify it. And, you know, we haven't really stepped up our consumption to match, you know, their, the, the output levels of, of, of uh, certified coffees. Mm. So it's on us. That's, um, yeah. But do, do you think there's a way, let's say, because um, uh, last week, uh, Jordan, the, my, my guest, uh, told me <clears throat> what is good coffee? Because specialty tends to be kind of um, trapped in this uh, taste uh, profile uh, mm. kind of coffee, where good coffee can be also good practice to really help producer and also respond to specific needs, uh, depending on the countries, the area, it can be violence, it can be a uh, uh, deforestation and different topics and so I was like uh, yeah I would be ready to buy less good coffee in terms of taste uh, if I knew where exactly my money was going but still up to today it seems like it's uh, it's still uh, not possible to do if you don't have a trust relationships with your importer or your roastery and or both and uh, to what extent do you think it's possible to have maybe non-specialty in terms of technically um, scored uh, coffee, but also coffees that are related to commodity, but just to make sure it does the right job, you know? Is the- Who can there? you trust? Who can you trust? <laughs> oh my God. I don't know. I don't... Listen, I mean, it's so interesting. When I began my specialty coffee journey, you know, uh, 10 years ago, and then I worked five years ago in the industry, began working, um, I was under the impression that, listen, any, any specialty coffee, is a better is a better outcome uh, than you know the state the status quo. It's all good, um, but the more I've explored it and the more I've seen the limitations of it, um, uh, the question that I ask myself more often these days is who can I trust to give me information? There are there are roasters who um, you know will, will 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 spin these beautiful stories about you know meeting farmers, but you know they'll still buy through the importer and they won't actually know what the farmer got paid. Um, so who, who can you trust when you have, mm -hmm. you know, the people who um, are roasting our coffee and selling us our coffee directly, you know, to be honest, there, there are very few roasters I actually trust these days. You have to really go above and beyond the standard specialty coffee roasted business model for me to even be like, okay, I'm, I'm going to buy, I'm, I'm going to trust you. Uh, because, I'm, I'm going to assume it's not um, that, that producers are not getting the right kind of deal. Mm hmm and uh, it's a bit dispiriting that uh, there are there are verses out there that do it they're not many but there are and i middle i make a middle list of them um on marginalizedfarmers.org if anyone is interested um uh but yeah it, but, that, uh, that's the thing but so it seems i farm could be a solution in on the long run if i think uh, develop much more it's using the blockchain technology to have really an understanding of where the money goes could be a somehow some kind of solution yeah i think it is it's it's not it's, it's by no means the it's by no means the the um a full solution because with blockchain okay let's imagine a world where every coffee we buy we know exactly what the farmer got paid Okay, this, but what did it cost them to make? And that is a whole nother question. Mm -hmm. but, you know, it, it's, it's, two, it's two parts of the equation. Um, and, and I think that what it cost them to make is, is a much, even, an even more complicated question to answer than what did the, did the farmer get paid? And um, so I see this as part of a journey, moving in a direction of, uh, the, but the fact that these sorts of conversations are taking place means people are interested and they care and they want to make change. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And this is, you know, people trying to use technology, in the example of Ifinka, to to bring about this kind of positive, to bring about this kind of change. But again, it's, we're, it's only one step in on, on a journey. I hope it's a journey we're going to get there before, you know, before the end of our lives. I really hope it is. <laughs> but 
I don't know. I don't know. Uh, okay, but really interesting. Um, okay, a whole different question, a totally different topic. Um, but um, what is the typical journey of a 90 plus coffee? Um, yeah, well, uh, I would imagine the journey is you, you know, I spoke to uh, Hacienda La Esmeralda the other day for a podcast. Mm -hmm. uh, another plug, sorry, another plug. The series coming out in January. Um, but um, it, it uh, there, you know, they, they, they sell a lot of their coffees at coffee auctions, like the best of Panama auctions. And, yes. um, and I think they even have their own farm auctions. Anyway, I forget, uh, maybe mis misquoting. But um, yeah, they put, they, put a, they put a lot of money into growing very, very high quality coffee. They have a brand. Their brand is powerful. The Panama Geisha brand, the La Esmeralda brand. And so, I know it, yeah. yeah. Who doesn't know it? I mean, who doesn't yeah, know it? Specialty is like, woo. Yeah, it's like, it's, it's the, the grand crew of coffees. I mean, it really is. Yeah. Um, that's how it's marketed. And, and, and you know, and fairly, it's, it's, it, I, I believe it's so. Um, and yeah, and so, and, and what happens is that, you know, people buy it from auction or you have direct relationships. Um, and this coffee, I think this coffee is air freighted oftentimes, you know, to roasters because it's that valuable, that freshness. When you're spending, you know, 50 bucks a pound for some of this stuff, like you have to air freight it because fresh, it, 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 freshness is, is of the utmost importance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, I don't know. It's important to have, it's important to have 90 plus coffees. It's important to have the Grand Cruiser coffee because it helps consumers rethink about what should we be paying for our coffee. It's mm -hmm. this idea that, you know, I even heard, I even heard that, um, you know, people in Panama right now are, are kind of wondering, when are we going to see the $10,000 a pound coffee? Okay, that's right, a nice challenge. Let's, can I just put that in perspective? We you know what $10,000 a pound coffee taste, uh, is going to cost per cup. Um, let's I wouldn't want to brew it because it's too much responsibility. <laughs> yeah, I mean, per cup, that's a 330 euro cup. <laughs> And that's not making any money as the, as the roaster. <laughs> well, people yeah, are talking well. about that. And but of course, in the wine world, that's like, of course, yeah, of course you pay mm. that kind of money for a glass of wine, yeah. I mean, whatever. Yeah. So, um, and, and it's fantastic that it's happening in coffee too. Um, different, but this is interesting, just this distinction because in the wine industry, uh, and no, I don't, I'm not as expert in that as, as coffee, but um, the, what you find is that uh, it is an industry for the most part, created by the global north and sold to the global north. And also the nature of the beverage, it is, you know, you crack open the bottle and you can drink it and the quality is preserved. It doesn't need an intermediary, you know, to, to change. Yeah. You don't need someone to like crush the grapes for you and then brew it and ferment it. I mean, they do, but you can put it in a bottle and it tastes great. You know, what if, what if coffee, you know, what if coffee could be the same? What if they could brew coffee at origin, at Finca de Esmeralda, for example? you know, into like this absolutely perfect little container that you can like mm. crack open and enjoy at a ceremony with your friends, you know. Um, when we get to that stage in coffee, using technology uh, to, you know, to, to make coffee brewing um, as simple as ready to drink wine is, then, yeah, yeah, yeah. then, then I think that that's going to be a crazy, that's going to be a really, uh, uh, that's going to totally. turn this century on its head. But until that time, we're hampered by a <clears throat> colonial supply chain that hasn't really changed very much. And mm -hmm. the fact that you need intermediaries because this product, um, you can't just whack this product into a bottle and open it and drink it. True, true. It's the main difference. Yeah. Yeah. But speaking of which, um, I hear more and more producing countries uh, start to roast coffee and to ship it also. Uh, do you think it's also part of a solution somehow to create added value in the producing country? Um, it is. Okay. Yeah. All right. It's great. And we should be supporting these efforts. Um, a big problem is actually, uh, and I didn't really, that's what I thought. Like, well, why, why doesn't like Mexico just like roast their own coffee and we just buy the roasted Mexican coffee? Um, but fundamentally, the problem is economies of scale. Because um, I would argue that for Mexico to, uh, uh, if they were to roast their own coffee, they couldn't make it as cheap as we can make it in Europe. Because of the economies of scale that we have at these gigantic roasting facilities in Europe and North America. I mean, we're talking 
you are dumping containers of coffee into these machines、mm-hmm. and getting out just the efficiencies are just extraordinary, and the efficiencies lead to a lower price. I mean, that could be replicated in Mexico. It could be, but、um, I not yet. I mean, we're not there yet.、Um, until we can get those kind of massive, massive efficiencies, like the Maxwell House, the ne- you know the Nest Cafe type efficiencies, you know, get an entire ship and stick the entire ship worth of coffee into a roaster. Until we can do that, you know,、um, mm. it, it, it's not going to be as、uh, it's going to be more expensive roasting、mm. at origin,、uh, and that's and unfortunately.、Um, What a colonial a colonial hangover is that coffee is has to be a, you know、um, we're shocked when coffee is more than three dollars a cup. That mentality is a legacy of colonialism.、Mm-hmm. Totally, where, totally.、Um, but it's、uh, it's tricky because even in some countries the price is defined by the government. Like in Italy, it's one euro at the counter tab. So this already puts a, a tricky situation when you want to to change. A few stuff,、yeah. but well, that's very specific to one country. But、um, no, 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 I totally agree on that.、Um, yeah. Okay, but I will、yeah. look more into the the I think、uh, project because I I saw it on your story、uh, last week、mm. and、uh, I already checked it a little and I didn't know about it. Well, I think I heard, but、uh, mm. didn't pay enough attention to it.、Mm. Um, but so definitely, there's, 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 there's some cool things I think.、Uh, some cool things. Yes.、Uh, they've been very supportive too. I must say of my podcasting projects. So. You know, yeah. What's going to be? It's going to be under future stories. <laughs> um, no, it's going to. So I'm making a, a lot of series coming out, but、um, okay.、Uh, the, the next big one is going to be.、Uh, so one one of them is going to be a history of coffee series with、yes. Professor Jonathan、oh、Morris,、uh, okay. six episode series、uh, where he and I were diving into, yeah, coffee from you know the cloud forests of Ethiopia through to like the mega factories of North America. You know that type、oh、of、wow. across a thousand years. Um, looking at little stories and anecdotes and and, and pictures and all that kind of thing,、um, we're halfway through now. It's and it's it's super good. I mean, I, I'm I, I'm absolutely. It's been amazing working with Jonathan on this.、Um, uh, so that, that will be released early next year. I'm also、okay. in the middle of production for a podcast series、uh, with Caffeine Magazine, the UK magazine. Yes.、Um, where it is, this is kind of like what Filter Stories kind of should have been. <laughs> But you know, it wasn't in the end because I, I kind of, I got, I got、Come、lost on, on the, the supply、so、chain. <laughs> But this is a series, you know, uh, 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 specifically targeted towards、um, uh, just regular coffee drinkers, and we ask questions, really, really simple questions, like, what is the difference between Rainforest Alliance and organic? Explain to me what the hell is the difference. <laughs> or it's like, oh my god, okay, I want to listen to that. Wow. Or it's like,、um, you know, what is You know, Jules, one of the co-hosts. She wants to buy coffee for her for her、uh, partner. She's going to spend seventy five dollars on a、um, hundred grams of coffee. Now there are two coffees she's going to spend seventy five dollars for. She could. One is Kopi Luwak, you know, Civet Cap <gasps> Coffee from、oh、Indonesia,、God. and one is La Esmeralda, Panama Esmeralda. La Esmeralda. Oh my goodness! Which one should she buy? They're both the price. <laughs> they're both exceptional experiences. <laughs> So experiences, yeah, their experiences. So, oh my we, god, that's so good. Okay. So we dive. So the way it works is that you know,、uh, they, they, there's a great. So Scott, the two co- the two hosts. Scott is one of the co-hosts. He's the founder of Caffeine Magazine, and Jules is a.、Uh, she's like a friend, and、um, they have these、uh, these massive arguments where they're like, no, Scott's like, no, it's all a waste of money.、And、Jules is like, why? But you can't do it well, um, and um, yeah, and then what what happens is、uh, they go off on these journeys around the world. So、um, we call up like the animal charity in Bali, and be like, "What's the deal with civet cat coffee? How are they treating the animals there?"、Mm-hmm. And then we call, you know, the Petersons. Oh my god! I've seen、Panama、some、Gate. videos. It's、uh, anyway, that's、uh... horrible. Yeah, yeah, yeah.、Uh, and then, then we call the Petersons from like Esmeralda, you know, in Panama, and we ask them, "We think your coffee's too expensive," and they're like, "We agree." <laughs> <laughs> And it's like, all right, well, that's good to know. Okay,、um, so we come, so so we have these really surprising conclusions. We go on these adventures、okay. around the world, and then we re- we learn about all these about these different perspectives and things, and then we come back into in the room, and we're like, wow, okay, so w- what are we going to do differently? And so,、okay. but、uh, there are so many great episodes. I'm really excited about this.、Uh, oh, here's one: carbon footprint, the carbon footprint of our coffee. Like, when you,、uh, what's worse for the environment? You know, 
drinking a latte in a disposable cup or drinking, you know, an espresso in, uh, yeah, or, or drinking an espresso in a, uh, I don't know. But what's the best way to be environmentally friendly with your coffee? Yeah, oh my God. It's kind of the impossible questions in terms of for a consumer to really be able to make a difference. We not only a consumer, answers. even. We find answers. Okay. <laughs> and, the answers are, and the answers are surprising. You would not, they're so counterintuitive. And it's like, wow. and so really it's like, uh, anyway, I'm super excited about it. Uh, that's coming out in January as well, you know, late January. So I keep, keep uh, you can follow the filter stories for that. And, find out yes yeah okay cool but i guess uh it's about to be it because it's been an hour and an so... hour with, with the yeah jump. yeah T time thanks everyone <laughs> thanks for joining everyone and waving hi margo hi andrea <laughs> hi everybody hi anna um, do you have anything else you, you would uh, jumping you would, on board uh, do you have anything else you would add before we end this uh, live session oh i don't know I covered so much you don't um, have to <laughs> Have it so much. <laughs> Coffee is only the beginning. When we start learning about where our tomatoes come from, where our bananas come from, cacao comes from. Hey, Rach. Where, um, you know, these, what does it mean to be a consumer in the 21st century with technology at our, you know, at our fingertips? Uh, that's what I'm super interested in right now. And mm -hmm. uh, coffee is just the beginning. There is so much that needs to be completely reevaluated. And this is a journey. So. Buckle up, that's what I say. Buckle up, we're in for a ride. Yes. I'm cool. I'm in, I'm in for the ride. I'm curious about the future. The future. Yeah. But thanks so much for having okay. me on. I appreciate it. Yeah, but thank, thanks for joining. And uh, I'll, I'll post uh, the video on the YouTube channel and uh, the link to your profile on Instagram to get more information about the future podcast. I guess you will yeah. advertise about it. There'll, uh, be lots of, there'll be lots of stuff on there. Yeah. Eyes peeled. Yes. Keep your eyes peeled. Yeah. <laughs> cool. All right. Okay. It's Thanks been fun. a lot, James.